Well, good evening, everybody. Uh, I am so glad that you are here tonight, and I am so glad that you have youth leaders that are willing to tackle these very foundational, elementary, but yet complex and essential topics of our faith and what we believe. Um, and so tonight, you know, as your pastor, I'm going to do the best I can to support you in this journey. I know you've already talked about father and son. And you're going to talk about things like sin and baptism and so on. Um, but today, I'm, hopefully I could bring together this whole um, Trinity thing for you in a way that you could understand and, and talk to you a little bit about the Holy Spirit in a way you could understand. You know, I remember when I was your age and, um, you know, I really had a very limited understanding of the Trinity or of the Holy Spirit. It just wasn't terms that were thrown around a lot. It seemed like everybody was confused about them. So I hope I could lift the fog today. I could give you a little bit more confidence and um, you could walk out tonight uh, feeling um, pretty good about the Trinity and understanding the Holy Spirit. Um, guys, I don't have enough time to clear up all the misunderstandings or explain all the scripture that has to do with the Holy Spirit of the Trinity tonight, but I can give you kind of a basic rundown of it. So let's begin with a little Trinity 101, okay? Now, we happen to live in a three-dimensional world, and all physical objects um, have certain heights and widths and weights and lengths, and, and, and one person cannot, can look like someone else, sound like someone else, and even behave like another person, but one person cannot actually be another person because we are in, like I said, a third-dimensional world world. But God, being God outside of the universe, holy, set apart, He is not limited by third dimensional um, limitations, uh, world or universe limitations, and because He's spirit and He's infinitely greater and more complex than, than we are as humans. And that is why uh, Jesus uh, or the Son can be different from the Father, but yet at the same time be the same as the Father. Okay, they could be two, but yet one. And the Bible clearly speaks of this over and over again. God the Son, the, uh, God the Father, God the Holy Spirit, and it keeps emphasizing at the same time that there is actually one God. And uh, I don't know if you're good at math, okay? I dropped out of uh, math before I got to calc or trig or anything like that. I think I did like algebra 2 or something and I got out. I couldn't do math. But let me give you a math problem uh, that maybe some of you guys can, can really understand. It, it's 1 plus 1 plus 1 equals 3. Okay? I mean, it's pretty simple math, right? That's the way we think. But with God, because He is, uh, again, outside of our third dimensional world limitations um, in the Bible, um, it explains that with God, it's 1 Son, one Spirit, one Father equals one God. God redoes our math, and and it's hard for us to understand that, but that's really what it what what's going on here in Scripture. And we use this word Trinity. It's not found in the Bible, but the principle and the belief um, the is is all over. The lesson of it is all over the Bible. Um, and I'm going to explain to you some of those scriptures in a minute. But let's start with the word Trinity. Okay, so Trinity really comes from the word triune, and tri means three, and un comes from unity, meaning one, and it really means three, one. That's what trinity means, three, one. And um, basically, it's just a term that people uh, created to explain or acknowledge what the Bible reveals to us about God, that there is one God that is three persons with three, you know, the same essence of deity. And the early church uh, Christians use this diagram to explain the Trinity, and the diagram uh, basically shows that you know that the Father is not the Son, and the Son is not the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit is not the Father. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are all God, but yet at the same time, um, and they are not three names for the for the same God or same person. Um, there are three. And yet, at the same time, they're one, okay? It's not one God. It's not three different gods. Um, it's, it's 
you know, it's, it is one God, but it's three persons, one God. And uh, another way I like to, to put it is, you know, um, the Father is always pointing towards the Son, and the Son's always pointing to the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit's always pointing back to the Father. Or, there are, or the Father's trying to glorify the Son, and the Son's always trying to glorify the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit's always trying to glorify the Father. They're always pointing and communicating, glorifying each other. That's why they exist. You know, some people have tried to use different illustrations for this. The, you know, three in one type of thing. And they, I've heard the illustration of water. Maybe you've heard this before. You know, if you take water, H2O, and you froze it, it becomes ice. You know, it's still water, but meaning it's still H2O, but now it's ice. Okay, it's changed form. And at the same time, if you heat it up, it becomes steam. Okay, so here you've got water in three different forms, steam, liquid, you know, hard ice, but yet it's still water. Three forms, still one thing, H2O. Another illustration that I've heard people use is with the sun. Uh, they say, you know, we receive light from the sun. We also receive heat from the sun, and we also receive radiation from the sun. Three different forms, uh, light, heat, radiation, yet um, one sun. One sun, three aspects. Okay, you know, there's no perfect illustration. There's lots of other illustrations. None of them are going to be perfect. Um, but I hope that that um, has, has blessed you and helps you understand the Trinity a little bit better. But what, what I want to point out now is kind of what the Bible says about it over and over again. Just because I, I want to show you where this is in Scripture. I, again, I can't list all the Scriptures, but let me point out a few things. In Genesis, when God's like creating things, it, one of the verses says, Let us make man in our image. Male and female, he created them. Now, you see some plural um, and some singular pronouns there. Notice that God... Um, before anything's created, he says, let us, let us. And God has, there's several different names for God, and one of them is Elohim, and, and it's, it's in the plural. And so, so it already starts with this idea of three in one from the very beginning of the Bible. And when Moses is standing before the burning bush, and, and he asks God for his name, God responds from the burning bush with the words, I am. I am eternally existed. I am. I've always been. And Jesus in the New Testament, he is the same phrase over and over again. He says, I am the light of the world. I am the bread of life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. And, and Abraham, okay, I know I'm just bouncing around here, but there's a lot in the Bible, so just hang with me. But Abraham, he existed like, I don't know, thousands of years before Jesus ever existed. And yet Jesus in the New Testament said, before Abraham was, I was even born, I am. He used the I am word again. And he said, before Abraham, that's thousands of years ago. And uh, Jesus was basically just saying, hey, uh, I am God, I have a relationship with God, and I have a unique relationship with my Father in heaven. And it, the people hated him for it, and they knew exactly what he was claiming. So they picked up stones, and they yelled blasphemy, and they wanted to kill him for it. Um, and he did this over and over again in Scripture. Um, my point is, is for all, all eternity, there has been this Father, this Son, and this Holy Spirit, and they've been in this relationship with each other and communication with each other, not as three gods, but as three persons as one God, okay? Um, it's Again, I, I don't fully understand it all myself. I don't think humans can, but it's there. It's in Scripture over and over again. Um, somebody once asked me, um, so if Jesus is God, then who was he praying to when he was on earth? You know, I think that's a really good question. By the way, if any of you guys have questions like that or other questions, there's no such thing as a stupid question. The only dumb question is the one that you refuse to ask because you can't learn unless you ask questions. That's how we ask. That's not a dumb question. I think I've thought that before. I think you've probably thought that before. Well, what I want you to know is on earth, Jesus commu continued his relationship and communication with 
the Father and the Spirit and continue that, that because there are three persons that glorify and point to the other. Um, there's lots of scriptures that show that even though the three persons, there's one God. Uh, Deuteronomy 6, 4 says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord our God is one, and the Lord is one. It's called the Shema. Uh, Isaiah uh, 45, 5 says, I am the Lord, and there is no other besides me. Um, there is no God. Uh, 1 Corinthians 8, 4 says, There is no God but one. John 10, 30 says, Jesus said, I and the Father are one. And I could go on and on about this, showing scripture after scripture about how there's one God in the Bible. But yet at the same time, I want you to know this. You might want to write this down right now. There are over 60 Bible passages that mention all three persons of the Trinity in the same context or sentence even. Uh, one of my favorites is in Matthew 3, verse 16 and 17. Uh, Jesus is being baptized, and after being baptized, Jesus went up immediately from the water, and behold, heavens were open, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove upon him. And then, behold, he heard a voice from heaven saying, this is my son whom I, I love, whom I'm well pleased. So you got Jesus in the water, you got a spirit appearing like a dove, and you got the voice of the Father, and it's all in that same context. In Matthew 28, 19, it says, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the, and get this, the Trinity. It says, The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So even though the word Trinity does not, the word doesn't exist in the Bible, but the principle and the basic Bible belief is immersed all throughout Scripture. Um, and it's, it's been going on since the beginning of time. So, all right, now that we've talked about the Trinity, I'd like to spend a few minutes just talking to you a little bit about the Holy Spirit, a little Holy Spirit 101 now. You know, on one side of this Holy Spirit talk, there's these uh, wildly charismatic people that, that, that seems to be all they talk about, all they think about, all they sing about, and you know, all they study. But on the other side are these conservatives that never acknowledge the Holy Spirit in word or deed. And what I'd like to do is kind of bring that confusion together, to bring that divide together, and, uh, and give you a better perspective. Because I've heard a lot of people talk very theolo theologically um, and scholarly um, about the Holy Spirit, but yet they don't experience the work of the Holy Spirit in their lives at all. And I think for a lot of us, I do think we need some, um, some intellectual knowledge on the Holy Spirit um, because I do believe a lot of us need to study it more. But at the same time, I think for most of us, what we need is we need more experiential learning, uh, experience, experiences with the Holy Spirit than um, just more talking. Um, because the Holy Spirit is more of an experiential thing. Now, with that said, if... Um, what, what if you grew up on a desert island and all you had was the Bible? Um, what would you think about the Holy Spirit? Because here's, here's why I bring that up. Because the Holy Spirit is mentioned so much in the Bible. Moving people, doing amazing things and miracles and, you know, empowering people. And just this power of the Spirit just moving through the early church. If you grew up on a desert island and that's all you had was the Bible. And what, you know, you would have to believe what the Bible said about the Holy Spirit. And I believe you would think from reading the Bible, that the Holy Spirit would be as essential as air is breathing, as air is to us breathing. Um, you would read about these unexplainable miracles, radical lives and boldness, and you, you wouldn't be able to think anything other um, about the Holy Spirit. Um, you know, when Jesus was preparing to leave this world, um, he was trying to prepare his disciples, and he, he, he told them three things. The first thing is he, he did three things. He comforted them by telling them that he was going to go and prepare a place for them. Secondly, he comforted them by telling them that uh, he's going to go be with his father and um, that he would uh, hear their prayers. And then the third thing that he did to comfort them is he sent them a comforter. In fact, the, 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 the Bible says that Jesus said another counselor uh, to be with them forever. It, it's in uh, four, chapter 14, verse 16. And I, I say that because the Greek word for counselor there is, is a word meaning uh, that, that he sent 
another of the same. Not another of a different sort, but another of the same. That, that he was sending uh, his spirit, which is of the same essence. Uh, different person, but the same. And I bet you when those disciples heard that some 2,000 years ago, I'm sure that it was hard for them to grasp it. In fact, they were probably thinking that they, they would rather have the human physical Jesus there in their presence um, than have uh, a spirit of Jesus that they, you know, not physically be able to see Jesus. And, and you know, thousands of years ago, um, that's, that's, you know, that's what I think they thought. But here we are thousands of years later, and I think many of us would probably say the same. We would probably say, I would rather have Jesus standing here next to me in the flesh than his spirit and his invisible spirit. And I say that because I believe that we um, have not um, experienced it. We haven't, we don't teach it. We're not aware of it. And I think the reason is, is because of uh, Satan. If I was Satan, my ultimate goal would be to thwart God's mission and his kingdom and his purposes. And one of the, one of my strategies would be to get churchgoers to ignore the Holy Spirit. Because if I could get them to ignore the Holy Spirit, then their lives would become uh, lacking power and they would become dissatisfied with, with the, the life that we're supposed to be living and they would feel like they're missing something. Now, how many of you have ever felt like uh, you've ever felt dissatisfied or you've ever felt like you were missing something? Now, the truth is, is I think um, the Bible says that you know, with all this talk of the Holy Spirit and the Bible and the power and the enabling and the comforting that comes from it, I think one of the reasons we feel like we're missing something is not because we're missing something, but because we're missing someone. And God has put that feeling of dissatisfaction inside of us to lead us back to that someone, and, and that's the Holy Spirit who was sent to help us live out this life here on earth. And I believe the Holy Spirit works more obviously um, and uh, more often um, in desperate places where people are humble and they're searching out for him and they want that, that, that lifestyle and they're crying out to him and they're not distracted by all the things that people get distracted of in the world pursuing wealth and, and popularity and comforts and stuff like that, like so, so many of us do. And the Holy Spirit is absolutely vital um, to, um, to life. Uh, to, to living a, a, the God-honoring lifestyle that we're called to, to live. And um, nothing could stop the Holy Spirit if, um, from producing fruit and working in your life if you would open your life up to it. And a world without the Holy Spirit is uh, a world that is, um, is full of people that are not empowered to live. A church without the Holy Spirit cannot make a difference, cannot move in kingdom ways, cannot... Um, has has no power. But a church or a world with the Holy Spirit um, can do huge things and it cannot help but to be different and cannot help um, but to be noticed by the rest of the world. You know, uh, the same way as Trinity can be explained, I guess, with an illustration of ice and the sun, well, the Holy Spirit can be explained with dancing and chocolate milk. Let me explain myself. In Galatians 5, chapter 25, um, it it says that we're commanded to keep in step with the Spirit. Now, that's kind of a dancing type of language, if you think about it. Keep in step with something. But the cool part is, is the Holy Spirit is leading in, in the dance. And we don't have to um, know what, where to go next. We don't have to uh, be perfect and we don't have to try really hard. All we have to do is focus our eyes on the Holy Spirit to, to be aware of what He's doing. And he, we just follow His lead. Now guys, I admit I'm a terrible dancer. You know, I went to every school dance because I always had a date and all that. But, um, but let's just say um, I didn't dance. I, I was terrible at dancing. But if I had somebody that, w that was uh, to follow, that was constantly you know, I, leading me, I would do so much better. And that's what we have with the Spirit. The Spirit is leading us through how to live this life out that, that we, God has called us to live. And all we need to do is follow His leading. Um, and with that in mind, to keep in step with the Spirit means to be aware of what He is doing now. Not just what he did in centuries past throughout Scripture, but what he is doing now in your life. 
And in order to do that, you need to be in prayer. You need to humble yourselves, and um, and you need to be open to what to what God's doing, and He will reveal that to you if you seek Him um, with your whole heart. the The other illustration I really like is is concerning chocolate milk. You know, people talk about being indwelt with the Spirit or filled with the Spirit, and uh, a lot of people talk about uh, you know there's a lot of scripture in the Bible like Ephesians one thirteen and Acts two thirty eight and other verses that talk about receiving the Holy Spirit at the moment of baptism or salvation, and 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 at that time when you receive it, it's kind of like if you took a glass, if you took a glass and you filled it with milk and like just white milk, I don't know, skim milk, I use skim milk, I don't know if you use 2% or something, and you took some chocolate syrup and you squirted it in there, it would all go right to the bottom, okay? And that's what it's like when you receive Christ and you, you, you get salvation at that moment, you, you get the Holy Spirit, it enters you and it's there, it's there. But it just, it's, it just hasn't gone throughout the milk yet. But the Bible says that if we constantly walk with the Spirit, if we keep in step with the Spirit, you know, we're doing that dance and we're, we're constantly doing that. That's like taking a spoon and sticking it in that chocolate milk and stirring all that chocolate up. And as we continue to walk, as we continue to stir, as we continue to live, as we continue to love and do all these things that the Holy Spirit's going to help us do, it stirs it up, and then that milk, that white milk, is transformed into something delicious, chocolate milk. Transformation is what the Holy Spirit's all about. And um, I, I love that illustration. You know, speaking of the Holy Spirit, 1 Corinthians 6, 19-20 tells us that our bodies are temples of, or dwelling places of the Holy Spirit. And I mention that because the Old Testament talks a lot about the Old Testament talks a lot about um, how God was with us. He was with us as we journeyed through the, the, you know, the desert and to the promised land. He's with us. You know? But in the New Testament, the language changes from with to in. That now He dwells in us. Okay, And here's, here's my point. Shouldn't having part of, the, part of God, a third of God, if you will, or, you know, part of the Trinity... Uh, inside of you, shouldn't that change your life? Shouldn't that make a huge difference in your ability to, to live out uh, this, this um, lifestyle we're trying to live out and, and who you are? And yet when I leave church and I walk out in the community, I go to Olympia ball game or I go you know, to a restaurant or I go to Walmart or whatever, go to a movie. Uh, when I go out in the community, I walk around and I see Christians, I see non-Christians. You know what? I have a hard time being able to tell the difference between the two. And, you know, unless I recognize their faces, I'm not even sure, you know, if they go to church, you know, otherwise, how would I know? Um, uh, let, me, let me use an, an illustration here for where I'm going with this. Um, I want you to think about uh, the confusion a caterpillar uh, must experience when it becomes a butterfly. Okay, so this little fat, chubby caterpillar uh, lives its whole life as this fat, chubby caterpillar, and it's crawling around on plants and it's like you know eating you know leaves or you know getting all dirty and fat, and it's got little hair sticking out, and it's like crawling on plants trying to not get eaten by birds, and then all of a sudden after it gets it eats so much and gets so fat, it just takes this nap, right? And it doesn't just take a nap, it takes like a really long nap. And then when it wakes up from this nap, just imagine what goes through its little head. I mean, all of a sudden, it wakes up from this nap, just kind of stretches out and it's like, oh man, you know, I, I, you know, when I went to sleep, I was this big, and now I'm this tiny little butterfly. You know, oh, what are these things? You got these giant wings. You know, but before it went to sleep, it was this fat, chubby, slow thing, and now when it wakes up, it's this skinny, gorgeous, beautiful thing, lightweight with giant wings. I mean, I don't know about you, but I would love it if I could just go to sleep and like wake up and like lose 20 pounds or something. That would be awesome. Just imagine how astonished, how stunned that caterpillar would be. Well, at the same time, 
The Bible says we have the Holy Spirit, we have God dwelling inside of us. Our bodies are dwelling, dwelling places, temples of the Holy Spirit. And guys, just as the caterpillar, as stunned, as astonished as a caterpillar would be to wake up after a nap and discover it's no longer a caterpillar, it's a butterfly. Just more than that. The Christian should be astonished and stunned by the work of the Holy Spirit, radically changing their lives, making them into to be a new Christian. And, uh, and that's, that's what it's like to have God dwelling inside of you. That's what we're all longing for. That's what we want. So guys, I hope you know, some of this has helped you out. Uh, you know, I, I know I didn't go real deep into the Holy Spirit, but um, I hope this has helped you to think about it a little bit, that and the Trinity. And, and I'm sure uh, your youth leaders will answer any of your questions. And, and I'd be happy to, you know, if you guys would write down questions, shoot them to me in an email, maybe as a group, and I'd be happy to, to reply again. So hopefully this has blessed you, and uh, I will see you on Sunday.